I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome to Unashamed. You know we like to uh, have fun with vocabulary on here, especially when Zach is on. Zach has a um, large vocabulary. He knows a lot of big words, lots of syllables. Sometimes Jace pushes back on some of those words. So, Well, I do that because I figure out of the, can we say, is it thousands of it, uh, listeners? Oh, it's more, yeah, than thousands. Okay, tens of thousands of listeners, when Zach drops one of these words like epistemology, I figure that there's less than 20 humans who have heard that. So then I have to stop because I'm thinking the other... 980,047 people think, do what? <laughs> what do you say? So I try to back up because I'm trying to simplify the message. Yeah. So, uh, or the common man. Yeah. So we, we, we have a young sister behind the board who runs it, and I, our I producer, had, Maddie, had sat in a way that was, uh, it was, I wasn't thinking, because uh, we sit here for hours, you know, and, and, and talk to you. <laughs> and so my right leg had fallen asleep, and I didn't realize when I got up and went to walk, it was not functional. <laughs> but I didn't fall down. <laughs> you just kind of dragged it along. But there was a hesitation, like, what's wrong with you? And I said, I was sitting, my leg, I was sitting in a way that my leg was cattywampus. And uh, I'm not how I'm not sure how old uh, our producer is, but she's young. And she's like, I said, you know what that means, don't you? And she she said, no. <laughs> but uh, so I used it in a context which would mean it was not in a normal operating function. It it got out of line with what I should do. It was cattywampus. But when I looked it up in the dictionary, according, because it could be wrong on my phone. Did you find it? it? Oh, yeah, but they, they, don't, they don't have this. They say it's an imaginary, fierce, wild animal, a bogey. A cattywampus? Yeah, that's what it says. Yeah, they got, they got that wrong. I've always heard it to mean uh, that, that went cattywampus. It was all cattywampus. It's like off. It was off kilter. It was, yeah. No, that's Caddy a wampus, wampus cat, is what that's talking about. They just had it backwards. That's a you've heard a wampus cat. A wampus well, they cat. They don't have yeah. it backwards though. Well, they said cat wampus. Well, it now I this, have heard of a wampus cat, but that's like a now. Kind of now nippy. listen to that. This is why the world is so confused. They say it's a noun. It's an imaginary fierce wild animal. Then it says, "What is a catty wampus used for?" So I'm imagining whatever this wild animal is going to be doing. Then it says, position diagonally, catter cornered, catter, catty cornered. That's it right there. Catty yeah. cornered. So it has a dual, it has a so dual So it is the meaning. same one. Yeah, it's the same word, but it just, I didn't, I hadn't heard the wild animal bogey. <laughs> I thought a bogey was something you make in golf, but evidently. And see, I always thought it was spelled with D's, like caddy wampus. So here's the. But point. Apparently, that's a band in New Orleans. Here's caddy the wampus. point. Now. Here's the <laughs> subliminal. Here's the. Here's the. Here's what I have learned from this discussion, because a lot of people are saying, "What? What does this all mean?" You never want to be sitting caddy wampus when a caddy wampus confronts you. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. good, Jace. <laughs> Whoa. You know, I need to repeat that. You, you, you never to want that. to be sitting deep. cattywampus when a cattywampus approaches you. Yeah, because it'd be a clash. Well, no, it would be over in about eight seconds. This yeah. wild animal, this bogey would devour you because when you got up to run, wouldn't your leg wouldn't work. Yeah. Oh, and you're right. It's a. Uh, it's basically whether it's an adjective or a noun, because the adjective means diagonal. You know, that's catawampus. So that was your word for that's the day. Key. Yeah. Feel free to use that. It's not a Scrabble word, but not, not a Scrabble word. It's versatile. 
And I just discovered, Jay's Caddy Wampus with two Ds is a band in New Orleans. So there, there you go. So there you go. So we fleshed that out. <laughs> Were you f- uh, familiar, Zach, with the term Caddy Wampus before we brought this oh, up? Oh, yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's part of my vo- vocabulary. I use a lot. Yeah. Which is part of the reason confusion happens, especially when you have a book this thick and, and words mean different things. I mean, I have some polarized glasses here. But some people are polarizing. See where I'm going with this? Yeah, I see you. So which is it? So that's why you got to dig deep, Al. (laughs) I was going to try this uh, wampus cat, but it says there's no such thing as a wampus cat. Yeah, not a word. But I've always heard that all my life, a wampus cat. I guess that's the Urban Dictionary. What Zach says, Urban Dictionary means nothing. Because that's not a real word. Yeah, Yeah, it's not not real. But it's a word in waiting, possibly. Yeah, yeah. Some of them, if they they rise to the occasion and they are accepted by the society at large, then it could move. Yeah, it could move into the the big boy dictionary. Well, we were going to apply this to the word baptism because no no one seems to know what that means. And so uh, we will get into that. But we left off at, speaking of... Jesus' sonship, you know, he's he's at the temple, he's 12, he gets left, or was it that he he left and went to his father's house and was having a discussion with all the leaders? And by the way, all the leaders were astonished and amazed at how much he knew at 12. Yeah, his understanding, it said, and and his responses— to what they were teaching, because that was another thing, Jace, that Shana showed the humble nature of Jesus, realizing he's 12, but he was listening to them. He said he was listening to the teachers for three days. But then he's obviously having a lot of response and, and things back, and that's what amazed him. They'd never seen well, a 12 Well, he became years. a human. He emptied himself, became a human, and so I think he's studying. That's right. He's listening. He's gathering He's showing us, you know, this is probably how you should have done this. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but, you know, people struggle with that because there a lot of people just imagine that he had full range of deity inside the human body from day one. But it's really, we don't get that impression here that that's the way it worked. I mean, well, what is 50? It's kind of a, a learning is- prep. What is 52 Made like his brothers in every way, which meant that he was a human being who was a part of growing up like we were to understand what it means to be a human being. Think about 252. What does it mean? And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's growing up. I mean, don't you think it's odd that he would become the bridge between God and man? At 12? Well, I'm just saying, <laughs> okay, he's he's God, but he's also, I mean, I don't know how else to describe this. I keep saying playing the game, but he is obedient. It just says he went to his father's house, but then he was obedient after they came and got him. He was obedient to his family. His, his parents. One of the terms that's used in like seminary is they talk about the dual nature of Christ. That he had he had two natures. He had a he had a a human nature and a divine nature. So he was fully God, and he was fully man at the same time. Yep. And it's it's difficult to get it, but um, one of the best kind of analogies I've heard of this, if you can make an analogy, is uh, William Lane Craig says it's it's like a tuning fork that. That you, if you hit it and it vibrates inside of a vacuum, it, it doesn't manifest in any sound. But when you take it out of the vacuum, then the, then you then it manifests with sound. And he says, like Christ's nature is kind of like that. He has two natures that, in one realm, it's it's expressed uh, as as human, and the other realm is expressed as divine. And, but I mean, it's complicated. But it's a good. I mean, I think that he, uh, you it's, it's, you got to be careful when you talk about it because it's we're not saying that Christ wasn't fully God. Christ is fully God in the flesh and it's a very complex thing to understand but i don't think we have to understand it all i mean we're talking about 
the incarnation of God, how do you fully grasp that anyways, right? I mean, yeah. it's, 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 it's pretty difficult. Well, I think people would say, so you got the Philippians 2, where it says he emptied, he emptied himself. But you look at what he did, he became vulnerable, as in he became a baby. So, but then he became vulnerable because of his love. But when he died, well, then he, it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So there you go. <laughs> he said, so, because he's God. Yeah. It, it's, it's, now he had the Holy Spirit at that point, which he's, you know, I think a lot of people, this very confusing when you go to, 321, and we're going to talk about John the Baptist because that's what's next, but we, we, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? We introduced the idea that Jesus' baptism was about him being declared by his father that he's the son of God, and then that seems to go in with why he was at the temple at 12. Now, I know, I mean, this is like, if you're watching a movie, this is 18 years later. You have John the Baptist come on the scene, and Jesus approaches John the Baptist about baptizing him. And you got to remember, if John the Baptist showed up at any of our churches, the first thing I think we would do is to get security and say, hey, now watch this guy here. <laughs> I know we're laughing, but I guarantee you, if John the Baptist came out of the portal and walked into your assembly this Sunday morning, security would take notice if they didn't know he was John the Baptist. That's right. They would. You know, they'd they would. say, watch him, watch him. And I'm sure somebody would say, you can't eat those in here. <laughs> if he had a little satchel of locusts. Yeah, didn't you see that sign? <laughs> no food, drink, or locusts in the auditorium. <laughs> well, he'd also probably have the a problem with no shoes, no shirt, no service for you. I think that was invented <laughs> at an actual church building. But so... Here he comes saying he wants to be, Jesus says, baptize me. And John the Baptist was humble. He was like, yeah. So Jace, uh, one of our sponsors, Barrel Buddy, um, they began their business a lot like we did. He said he was sitting out in a field hunting and his gun, the innards of his gun got wet and he didn't have a good way to clean it. You know, he had the old patches. He tried that, but he couldn't get the gun cleaned out. And he was like, there's got to be a better way. So I do like people that come up with ideas while they're actually out doing something, you know, where they're hunting or whatever, right? I mean, it's usually the mother of invention. Yeah. I just noticed when you look into a barrel after you hunt, it's always really dirty. Yep. Always. Yep. And when it's raining, it's even worse because you get all that stuff that sticks in there with the water. So these guys, that's how they discover they're great uh, business. Uh, they're, they're believers, uh, which we love doing business with guys that kind of believe like we do. Um, but they came up with this system to be able to clean out your gun barrel. Uh, like I said, the patches don't work very well. The boar snake, which everybody used for a long time after that, you really can't tell your gun's clean because you know of the color of it. So they use this polymer where you can tell, you can see what comes out of your gun barrel. Um, they do a great job. You can safely use uh, commercial solvents with oil. You can use it dry either way. Uh, it's a quick clean uh, right after you hunt. You can use it and clean your gun or after you're at the range as well. So we love these guys. We support them. Uh, we want you to check them out because uh, we know a lot of you guys shoot out there. Go to BarrelBuddy.com. That's BarrelBuddy.com and check out their product. Matthew 3.13, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. John tried to deter him. Now, John's been doing this, and he says, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? So, obviously, you know, because they're related. You would have thought they, 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 that was a fact, and then they had it all worked out. But yeah. It's... No, it surprised him that he showed up for this. And then he's also saying, look, he's been watching him. And he's like, 
you need to baptize. You're, you're a better dude than I am. So Jesus says, let it be so. Now it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. And then, of course, what it says here in our text, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. That moment, heaven was opened and he saw a spirit of God. He saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So that's that's the actual what what happened and John's reluctance to baptize him. So the first reaction, if if someone is this first time they're hearing this, if John the Baptist's baptism was about repentance, and it says, uh, where's the quote? Uh, verse verse three, three of three. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low, the crooked road shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. That's Isaiah 43, 2, 5. So John the Baptist was a fulfillment of prophecy. Correct. And, and that's why he was part of what I called the marketing campaign to point people to Jesus. So why is Jesus being baptized if John's ba- baptism was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins? Which he, I will promise you this. Jesus had no sins. No, he didn't need it. Right? Right. So I'm just... Which let's, is why let's John explain was... explain that to people who have never studied this. Which was why John was reluctant because he knew what his message was. This is a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins and and preparing for the Messiah. Because when you look over in John 1, when John retells the happening that happened here, he says when, when Jesus walks up after he baptized him, John says, look, the Lamb of God. Who so, takes away the, he, takes away the he was, I think he's the only one that got that right at that point. And, because and, he witnessed this. Spirit of God like a dove and the voice. That's how he knew. Exactly. And, well, I just think he kind of knew, too. You know, he, he just, the, about the birth. I mean, I'm sure he heard the story from his sure. parents. It's like he came from a virgin. I mean, he probably believed. It. Very few people believed it, but I, I, I just would think since he came from a similar situation. But I will say this, too, because when I was reading what scholars think about this, there are some that think John the Baptist didn't have any sin, but I do not think that's accurate. Even though the Holy Spirit came on him from the womb. Oh, he was a sinner. Yes. And so, I mean, there's only one perfect Well, that's why adult. That's why he said, I mean, he said it. He said, I, I, no, I need to be baptized by you. So I think that statement from John the Baptist is an indication that he knew he was a sinner or he would right. not have said, well, wait, wait, you want me to baptize you? No, no, I need to be baptized by you. And well, the reason people, yeah, the people, reason the scholars said that is because they said the Holy Spirit came on him at birth, and that he would he would do the Nazarite, uh, what was that called? The Nazarite vow. The Nazarite vow. I'll let y'all explain that, but I mean that that's their thing. I mean, I was surprised a lot. A lot of scholars said said that. I, yeah. I was I was confused by that and perplexed. Well, and the Nazarite vow is just a, a setting aside. Um, it's a lot of times it was for a certain period of time, like with Samson. He was another one that had the Nazarite vow, but it was just for a period of time, and he didn't quit drinking alcohol. Samson, he, he drank plenty. It was just a hair thing with him. And so there were different times in, in where this vow was taken, usually for a period of time. John's the only one I've ever read about from the Old Testament to the New that basically was under a Nazarite vow his whole life. In other words, he, he was dedicated to one specific purpose, and that was this, to, to do what he did, to preach to people, to baptize them. What's interesting is I can only assume John was probably baptized. He probably got one of his disciples to baptize him. He seems like the kind of guy, if he was going to be baptizing people for repentance and forgiveness of sin, that he probably had somebody baptize him. I don't know that because the Bible doesn't tell us, but I would say yes. I would think he did because he started this, you know, new thing as you said Dad, that nobody had ever heard of before. It's an interesting thought. Yeah. So I reiterate my question: Why was Jesus baptized? Which is a good question. 
by John, if John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, if Jesus had no sin. Well, one is that Jesus said it. It was for the fulfillment of, of all, all things. Of all righteousness. Of all righteousness. So in other words, even though he wasn't a sinner, he was saying, this is, this is to recognize who I am. Because he knew, I don't know if he knew what was going to happen, but in that moment, he would be recognized as the Lamb of God. That was the second thing I would say, Jay, was to, for this moment to happen so that John would recognize him and later others would. Yeah, yeah. I think there's multiple reasons for the baptism of Jesus. I don't think it's one and done. I mean, one, I mean, yeah, he wasn't a sinner, but yet what is? I mean, he identifies with sinners. And right. so it's like, you know, he's able to, so it's almost like, I mean, everything he did. I mean, he died for us. He, I mean, he baptized for us. I mean, everything is a proclamation. You got to keep in mind, too, that John the Baptist, his parents, his dad was a member of the um, uh, Aaron line of priesthood. And so there's that there's some there's some priestly stuff going on where the priest would offer the sacrifice for sins. So there's there's that, too. Right. That that you, you're presenting the lamb of God, you know, yeah. the lamb, the sacrifice. So there's that moment. There's uh, there's the the the, the uh, kind of the revelation of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit at his baptism. Uh, I, I, I think that another big part of this is what, remember what John said about the baptism. He said, uh, repent for what? For the kingdom of God is, is near. So there's the, there's the coming of the kingdom uh, that's happening here. I mean, there, it's like kind of all of it. There's the ceremonial washing because this is Jesus about to embark on his ministry and the Holy Spirit's going to come, come in him. So there's that. I mean, there's just so many things here of what's happening in this moment. It's not a one and done or one thing, or it's 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 a lot of different things that are coalescing into a moment, and it's a very big moment in biblical and, history. And without sure. the Spirit, it would have to be broader than just saying you do this as a one one time and gone, because great point. Without the Spirit, there is no love. I mean, just look at a world. And the ones who do not have the spirit of God in them, they 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 are their characteristic: love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Well, if that's the fruit of the spirit, it's far deeper than just a marker. It, it's a yeah, whole yeah. change in a it's a complete lifestyle change. Man, that's good. Yeah, I think that's one of the well, going back to our conversation from the last podcast. Why do people? I mean, push without him, they, they, I mean, these qualities are just not going to come your way. I mean, no, you can't separate it. You cannot separate the Holy Spirit from baptism, and even in Jesus's baptism, you it, and it's not a one and done thing. You know, we, we, we teach correct. Romans six. And Romans six is a great passage to go to to understand what baptism is, yep. and how our baptism how it connects us with the death the bear on the resurrection of Jesus. But you read Romans six and by no means is that language a one and done. I mean, that, it is a, right. I mean, it is a mess. It's actually a text on sanctification, yep. even more than it is justification. It's the ongoing process of being transformed, a new lifestyle, a new way of living, a you, new way of seeing you. the world. It, it, that's it. That's good, Phil. And that's why when you study Romans, it naturally takes you into Romans seven, Romans eight, which shows you the whole idea about what a Holy Spirit led life looks like. That's right. And that's why he got into that. The same thing is that I keep thinking back to John 14 through 16 when I think about this context, because Jesus' baptism no doubt showed there's a link, you know, once he's gone, of the Holy Spirit being linked to faith, repentance, um, forgiveness. And peace baptism. is used a lot of that peace of mind. Which is the, in my opinion, the rarest of commodities. It's peace of mind, right? In a very sinful world, and with all you deal with, you said it's just a powerful hope that's given you. I mean, power that you have, right? And he told the mm -hmm. disciples Awful. in that in those three chapters, unless I go, the Holy Spirit won't come. Now that's yeah. I, I don't know how much clearer that is. The idea that he had to leave. For, to then pour out his Holy Spirit to be available for us. I mean, he said that very plainly. And the elevation of the of who the Holy Spirit is, right? I mean, we I mean, we think Jesus, we know Jesus is God. We know he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So when that guy says, 
it's good that I go because if I don't go, he's not going to come. Yeah. Then whoever the he is that he's talking about yeah. is on the same le- at least on the same level with him. That's it. Which you know, I think that and so you see it here in this picture. I mean, this is the picture in the Bible. One one of the greatest pictures of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the incarnation of the Son, all in a moment, all in a moment. You know, it's it's very tangible for us to get our. We can see that, and we don't know what all that means, but we can at least kind of see it in a in a in a visceral way we can touch it and think okay i kind of get what this is a little bit you know so we got some uh, exciting news from some of our really good friends i've been friends with the guys that uh, focus on the family for quite a few years uh they've been down here dad they did a christmas special one time with you and mom and uh, jim and john came down to their show from here lisa and i did three episodes of their show just talking about our life and story which is very rare so we kind of have a long history with those guys they uh also published mine and lisa's book uh, desperate forgiveness and now they've got a new podcast um and man it's, it looks like it's going to be really exciting it's called crazy little thing called marriage which is I guess kind of based on the old Queen song, Jace, crazy little thing called love. I would sing it, but man's got to know his limitations. <laughs> yeah, probably so. Um, but it's uh, it's a podcast for married couples. Uh, could be in the middle of messy moments, which we know marriages get there. Uh, could just mean they need a laugh, Dad. You know, sense of humor is important in marriage. Um, clear, practical, biblical advice, which is what Focus has always been about, which is what we love about them. Uh, Greg and Aaron Smalley, uh, who I've met them two or three times, really great couple, uh, do a lot of counseling, do a lot of these uh, marriage intensives, so they really know what they're doing. Uh, they've reached millions of couples uh, through their counseling practice, their books, and more. Uh, every episode hits on something relevant, like communication, intimacy, dealing with money issues, daily stress. So I want you to check them out. New episodes of Crazy Little Thing Called Marriage drop every Monday. You can find it on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite listening source. Crazy Little Thing Called Marriage. Download it now. You'll be blessed. And it also kicked his ministry off to us. There's another reason. All right. Well, good. See, I asked y'all that. Let's get it back to you. This was a, it was a trap. (laughs) Because I wanted to see what y'all said before I wanted to say what I wanted to say. And uh, because I really wrestle with this, and I have said everything that y'all have said before, but I kind of just looked at it practically, and I thought, well, what was the declaration when John the Baptist baptized people? Well, if you read chapter 3, there was a declaration. It said he preached a baptism for repentance, of repentance, for the forgiveness of sin. So what was the declaration? You're forgiven. Well, what was the declaration when Jesus was baptized? The declaration came from God the Father, and he said, you're my son. So that's a little different declaration, but it has the same implications. Now, what was the reasoning of the baptism? Uh, John the Baptist said, same same reason. Uh, Jesus is, you're going to believe in in Jesus as the one God sent. And so, well, Jesus, when he was baptized, he's the one God sent. So that that is the same. Uh, And so then, well, what happens? Well, in John the Baptist's baptism, he says in verse 8, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. So his baptism was a baptism of repentance. What are you supposed to do? Well, produce fruit in keeping. So so repentance is more than just a change of behavior. I think we'd all agree with that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's a the reasoning of that was Jesus, because you're now believing in Jesus. It, it's not a one time thing. You you will then produce fruit. But in Jesus's case, well, he received the Spirit. Well, we know what that is. Now you're going to have the fruits of the Spirit, to your point. So, but, you know, this was more about you trying to to produce fruit. And so then I think when you look at John the Baptist's role, which was to be the link between the nation of Israel and the old law and be that bridge to Jesus, 
I think the difference is, yeah, you're forgiven. Uh, you're you're going you're believing in the one coming. It be and you should produce fruit, and and that's why John the Baptist was so interested on social and and moral issues. It, but the common thread was you're doing it because of the one who's coming, and then Jesus is declared the identity: "You are my son." So then it completely goes from ritual to relational in this in this transition of baptism. You're yes, you're fulfilling all the, you know, the requirements of cuz this is the requirement. You I mean, John, why did God send John the Baptist? It was a prophecy of yeah, you you do this. And so I think to get back to Zach's point we were discussing about baptism, I believe a lot of people are using baptism the same way John the Baptist was. And and not enough people are doing it for the reason Jesus was baptized, which would be be the That's relational receive receiving of the Spirit. Both were focused on Jesus, and in both you repent. You know, when Peter later on, after the Spirit is poured out in Acts two, what's funny to me, not funny but ironic, is he he says them both. He says repent and be baptized. I mean, John. John the Baptist was more about repentance, and Jesus, the fact that he did this, I think should should get your attention, because he didn't. Let's just face it, he didn't have to do that. So why did he do it? Which comes back to my point about the surrendering, humbling nature of what it means to follow and put your your hands in God above. I, I think that's why he did it. He humbled himself, he became a human, but he also listened to his parents, he obeyed what they said, he also was baptized when he had no sin, and there was a declaration, you're my son. The reason I'm making all this is then when you read something like Galatians 3, now we're way after all this happened, and Paul's writing to the Galatians, and he makes this same identical analogy to us. He says in Galatians 3, 26 and, and 27, you're all sons, because I told you that I think this is about sonship, that identity. He says, you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female. You're all in Christ Jesus. Well, then it goes on talking about children who are heirs and then he says, verse 6, because you are sons, chapter 4, verse 6 of Galatians, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son, which I get in back to the John the Baptist. I did this in overtime last time. Baptizing people in the Jordan River, which was the last place that the Israelites cross when they went from slavery to freedom and i think it was symbolic of this transition out of that old system into focusing on jesus that's what i think no and i agree and which is why i think that peter in acts 2 was then taking what john had started but bringing along what was now new by saying repent and be baptized and you will receive the gift of the holy spirit not gifts gift of the Holy Spirit. In other yeah. words, he will now indwell you to be that fruit bearer in your life. So, I mean... That's what stood out, though, when I read John's account, which we haven't read this yet. I mean, I read some of it. So he comes out in verse 3, uh, and, and look, it has all these details, which I love about Luke, because this is not some made-up story. You know, in, in three one says it was in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius C Caesar. Look it up. He was the second Roman. He was emperor, the next one. And it was right in the time frame here. Now we hear about Pontius Pilate Pontius the first Pilate. time. Pontius Pilate. Oh yeah. Oh, he was actually a real person. Yes, he he was, and he lived in the same time frame as Jesus. Yeah. Huh. And then here's Herod. You can look all these people up. And which I mentioned that before, and then Philip, and then there were two other ones. The the kingdom of Herod, the king we read about earlier, has now been farmed out to four sons. And so those are tetrarchs, or, you know, basically they have their own little kingdom split in four. So this seems boring when you read it. In 
the lair, and I guess in the eastern lair where Zach is, we are littered with Phil merch, uh, Blaze merchandise. We're wearing shirts today uh, that are on philmerch.com because we want to encourage you guys to check out um, all of the apparel and the different things they have there. They also have these coffee mugs. Here's one uncanceled, unashamed. Zach, you got an unashamed mug up there in uh, North Carolina, my, right? My coffee, my hot coffee. And a fill mug, yeah. You know, one of the things by wearing our apparel does is it causes people to ask you questions. What is that? What is an unashamed? Who ever heard of that? So it just provides you an opportunity to tell folks about the podcast. I know that our podcast is a word of mouth thing. So that's what this merch is about. Uh, we encourage you to check it out. Phil Merch, M E R C H dot com. Until you realize that these were actual people in actual places where the ramifications of what happened, if that did happen, if there was a guy named Jesus who came from a virgin and he lived a perfect life and the Holy Spirit came from heaven, descended on him and he died, you know, for your sins and was resurrected. Well, that's a game changer for you 2000 years later. Yeah. I, I, and I, I don't think we can overestimate the power of the Holy Spirit and all this. And I'm glad we're, we're kind of honing in on him because, um, I think, and not not intentionally. I think they've, I, I, but I've had people come to me, and I've had conversations with people about baptism, and they believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is is like the miracles, the speaking in tongues, or whatever. And I'm like, man, what a how diminishing to the Holy Spirit. I mean, really, to to think that to reduce him to just that, like that's the epicenter, that's the evidence, that's the thing. That's not what this is talking about here. This is not talking about, you know, it says when, when I come, when he comes, he'll baptize you with spirit and fire. I mean, that we're talking about something way bigger than the gifts of the spirit. We're talking about the giving of the spirit, like the, he, he himself is coming to live in his believers. In, we, become, we become the new temple. And I mean, like, so when Jesus is there and he says, this is a, a necessity for us to, to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Part of what he's talking about there is that uh, is that to truly fulfill all righteousness is is for us to have oneness with God, and and that happens through the cross of Calvary. That's going to happen at some point in the future, from when he says this. But then, to to Phil's point earlier, it's not a one and done deal. I mean, it's that's true right. liberation and freedom that comes through dwelling with God, abiding with God. You know, we are sons of God as uh, Romans 8. I think uh, Jason's quoting Romans 8 a while ago. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father, we didn't receive a, a spirit of fear or, tim- or timidity, but we received a spirit of sonship. That that spirit of sonship uh, that Paul's talking about in Romans 8, that's in the context of life by the spirit. I mean, that's what Romans 8 is about. How do we live by the spirit? We live by the spirit as sons of him. And by him, we cry, Abba Father, it's not a begrudging submission. It's not a fear. It's not a oh, I got I have to do this to, to be saved. I got to do none of that. Like when you, if you're approaching it in that way, you've missed it. So your point, Jace, that you said at the beginning beginning of the last podcast, a hundred percent agree. No, a thousand percent agree. Man, we're talking about a surrender here. That is that is we are we are folding in under a God that is our Father, who we trust that to have our best interest in mind and we know that we can trust him because he's good that's what's happening here in this moment is that is big that 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 truth that reality is coming to earth and it's being sewn up in the baptism of jesus no i would uh uh wholeheartedly agree and i would say you looked at my notes but i don't have any so i know that didn't happen <laughs> maybe just read your mind. because i was gonna go to point number two and these are god's points not mine so when jesus was baptized he said this is my son because I'm laying a, a platform to where I believe the same thing that happened to Jesus in this moment happens to us. We hear who Jesus is, we are convicted, and we decide to surrender. And I believe the same thing that happened to Jesus in that moment was a pattern to what would happen to us. We find our identity. Through that surrender. So I think God says the same thing. This is my son. That, that's why 
the Galatians 4 passage says, we're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all of us who were baptized. So it's not male or female. That is a declaration because it had to do with being an heir, which the son was the heir. So we get that. And women don't be offended because he also calls us sheep. So, you know, he's just using an illustration of we're eternal beings. We're an e- e- eternal family. But the second point he said, whom I love. So the whole reason Jesus became vulnerable, you know, God becoming vulnerable was out of love. He be- he came a baby. Why-, why did he come here? I mean, his name, Jesus, means God saves. So we know that's the loving side. And so he said, this is my son whom I love. So to your point, Zach, when people say the baptism of the Holy Spirit is just about miracles and, and wonders and signs, and they're looking for that, there was a group of people who also struggled with getting their head around that, and that was they were called the Corinthians because they were from Corinth. And they some of the ways they were using the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the miraculous caused some chastisement from one Paul would you agree that's a correct assertion? Correct. They were putting a little too much focus on the miraculous side. And I want to read you something which is a withering, I mean, just a withering uh, chastisement. So just to give you the context, in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13, it sounds a lot like Galatians 4, I mean, Galatians 3, 26, 27, and Galatians 4, 6. The body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit or in one spirit into one body, which sounds a lot like John the Baptist's assertion that there would be one that would come who would baptize you in, with, or by the Holy Spirit and with fire. And watch what it says. Into one body, whether Jews or Greek, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink, which goes back to my illustration about having the milk thrown on you or in you. Well, in this case, I think they had both. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They were, you know, the apostles had given them the ability to do the miraculous, but they also were given the spirit to drink inside them no. A Holy Spirit came in them. Internal, indwelling. But my point is, when he gets to chapter 13, he makes a declaration that says in verse uh, 1 and 2, he says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I mean, most of the times we miss the point of this because we're like, oh, isn't that, isn't, that, isn't that sweet? But think about what he's saying. What he's saying is, because verse 2 says, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have a faith that can move mountains, all these things are miraculous type things, but have not love, I'm nothing. So you say, what, what's his point? When it says, this is my son whom I love, and we'll get to and and whom I'm well pleased. That act of love that Jesus did declared him in his life and being here and his death and his resurrection and your being in him, you being having the same spirit that he got, your identity is you're you're now a son of God. It's better than any miracle you're gonna come up with. That's why I Because pa- then the fruit of love can come out. Yep. It, it, it's way better than any miracle ever. Jesus is better than miracle. So that's why when Paul was talking to Timothy, he said, I remind you, after he had to give him a little admonition, he said in 2 Timothy 1, about verse 6 or 7, he said, this this reason, Timothy, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. So when he said the Holy Spirit and fire, you say, what could it be? Watch. I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. 
He's talking about the Spirit, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit, here's coming out of the hill, Holy Spirit, and then the fire it builds, a spirit of timidity, not, a, not that, but a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me as prisoner. Join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us, called us to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us, check this out, before the baby in the manger. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. So when you look at the whole thing and just back up and look, the purpose, you got a baby, you got a manger, you got a John the Baptist, you look at all that. That was all groundwork already planned out down to the, I mean, last day. It's now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, which we're over in on Luke, who has destroyed death. Just think about that. And has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We're back to the good news. So... You look at it like that, you say, boy, I mean, that's where the fire part, you know, you, you know, you, if, if there's no fire in the, in the wood and the, there's, there's, you, you better get some built is, is his point. Well, I think it's fruit that will last is the difference yeah. here. Look, and yeah. people ask me about miracles and I'm like, you know what? Yeah. Do I believe in miracles? I'm like, yes, but I'm not near as excited about that as I am Jesus. And here's why. So you take, if you made a movie about Lazarus, and, and I'm talking about the complete movie of his life, well, you have this moment that happens in John 11 where he's raised from the dead. I believe that's about as powerful a miracle that can ever happen. That's a big boy one. miracle. Well, in the end, it would be kind of uh, dissatisfying because I hate to tell you this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He dies, he dies again. Yeah. Well, if you have the Holy Spirit inside of you and you have Jesus and you make a movie about your life, you, in the end, you, you live. And that's why Jesus and his love is better than the miracle. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Well, <laughs> hey, last night, last night I got a call from a guy that we all know a dear friend of our family, Zach Stevens, and we were just talking, catching up, and I keep up with him. A yeah, backstory on Zach, for those of you who don't know him, he got in a motorcycle accident, lost his left leg, has had a horrible time recovering, and it just won't heal, so he hasn't got his prosthetic yet. I think this happened over a year ago um, or around a year ago, and he's just been like, so we had this deep conversation last night about prayer and about miracles, and he's like, man, I'm, I'm like literally in the shower just crying because his leg will not heal. I mean, it's like, it is a, and he's in a lot of pain, can't sleep at night, this all kind of stuff. He's like, and I'm begging God, just not pouring out of my nose, crying, God, God, heal me. God, please just heal my legs. So I can get the prosthetic. Just heal me. And just begging God. And he said, and this hadn't happened yet. And he's like, what do you, what do you make of that? And man, we had like a real honest conversation and, and uh, something he told me that stuck with me that he said, you know, it's funny. I've been praying for the healing and I, and I haven't gotten that, and it seems like the answer is at least a, a hard no, not right now. And maybe it's never. He said, I don't know what the, what the end holds. He said, let me tell you when it started to change for me. He said, just recently, I just ha I came to the conclusion that God's answer might be no. And and I've just been resting in that. He said, and, and it's the first time I've had peace to this whole thing. It's just, you know, God is in, I, I have him. Uh, you know, he's better than the leg. I mean, even if the leg, even if, even if it didn't happen, he made your point, Jace. I mean, I'm still here for 80 years and then what? You know what I mean? then, And I just thought that was an interesting perspective on it because we, we get so hung up on that. But, man, when you find people that are in real suffering, you know, sometimes you don't get your miracle. Sometimes you don't get that. But you still get Jesus. You still have hope after the grave. You still have hope of a, of a new body. You still have hope of, of eternal life with this triune God, with this, this thing of him. So I'm with you, man. I think we got to make him primary 
And we got to recognize that he is, the miracle giver is better, way better, infinitely better than the miracles that he gives. And I think that's the key. Well, and you, the, the description you made of Zach's, where he's come to, is exactly where Paul came to in 2 Corinthians 12. He said, I asked, in his case, three times for whatever it was that was tormenting him. And he his message back, maybe more directly, I don't know, than Zach got, is no. I'm enough. And he said, therefore, I delight more in weakness and and, and, and persecution and everything else because Jesus is enough. And so I, I think there are those cases like that. And to both of y'all's point, the idea when the, the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts 2 and we see those languages are present and they're praising God and everybody's, the whole point of that was only to draw a crowd so that he could tell them about Jesus yeah. and get yeah. to what really mattered. So the whole idea of miracles, Jace, we've talked about this through every study in the gospel we've had. They only point you to the miracle worker. Yeah. Their purpose is not in the miracles themselves. That's why I did the comparison between John's baptism and Jesus. They had a lot of things in common. They were both focused on Jesus. They uh, they were both done in water. So they were both, repentance was was going to be there. As, as far, even though Jesus uh, didn't have to change from anything he had done, but he then began his ministry. So he, there was a, a change in the way he was going to operate. He, he went public, basically. And so when you, when you say, well, what does that mean to, how does that apply to us in Acts 2? I think the one difference is it, it, was declaring the identity of who you are now with God. And and they both required surrender. So when you surrender to Jesus, because that is what both of them were about, and, and, this, and the other difference was that you didn't get the Spirit with John the Baptist. So you get the Spirit and you get your identity in Christ, and you do it through surrender. So I think it's it's a terrible view to all of a sudden get to baptism and say, we well, ought to do it because it's commanded, or you ought to do it because Jesus done it. I just think it's deeper than that. I think it's an opportunity. He did command his disciples to go preach the, the gospel and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son. And some people yeah. say, oh, that's a command. Right? Well, he commanded them to do it. But to me, if you hear the story of Jesus and you hear that there's an opportunity to surrender it and reenact it, it's no longer about a command. It's it's something that your heart should be convicted to want to do. I mean, and, and it's because of Jesus and what he did in that moment. So I think that's how it gets confusing. And um, we're about out of time, but I would add to the last statement he says there, just to complete your analysis of the Jesus' baptism is, um, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And the idea is ultimately we want to please God. And I think about the Hebrews passage that says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And well, exactly. So that and and that I do thing. think it's a reference of when Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men, even from 12 years old. And I think that ties into when it says, with you, I am well pleased. And the bottom line with what you're saying, if if you're in good favor with God based on your humility, your humility and your reliance on him, that is the best place to be in life. That's it. That's it. No doubt about it. All right, we're out of time. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more in our overtime. If you want to follow us over, blazetv.com slash unashamed is where we do that overtime. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, Subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.